there. Happy New Year. Welcome one and all to the Charisma Vacuum podcast. My name is Daniel. I'm delighted to welcome you to this episode 010, otherwise known as episode 10 of the show. Charisma Vacuum podcast is a podcast where me and my friend Matt, we just chill, relax, talk about rubbish, talk about nonsense, talk about nerdery, talk about geekdom, and all that good stuff. We're currently streaming live on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash Charisma Vacuum as we do every Thursday night at 9pm UK time forget that it's currently Friday we're archiving the show on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes CastBox and wherever you get your podcasts from if you'd like to interact with us please feel free to do so add in the Twitch chat, the YouTube chat uh, email prismavacuumpodcast at gmail.com we'd like to hear your feedback the good stuff, the bad stuff, anything you'd like to tell us Um, so, right all that good stuff out of the way, it is time to introduce the aforementioned good friend of the show, he goes by the name Mr. Matt, he is Mr. Matt Welcome to the show, Mr. Matt. Hi, Dan, and also Happy New Year's. Sorry, I was holding off on uh, saying that earlier. Thought I'd do it now. No, that's absolutely fine. Happy New Year to you, and Happy New Year to everyone listening. 2020 is out of the way. We are now in 2021. Uh, in fact, that's... Yeah, I, I think I was going to regale the people with the spiel of how this episode has taken us a, a good few days to get around to, uh, <laughs> for various reasons. Um, but forget that. We're in 2021 now. Um, onwards and upwards, hopefully. Uh, yeah, let's let's put our fingers crossed, get our fingers crossed, and uh, and hope that it's a fortuitous year for this podcast and for ourselves and for everyone. Here, here to that. Um, yeah, right, Matt. <laughs> how, how have you been? How how was your Christmas? Oh. We we had a fantastic uh, episode last week on Christmas Eve. Really enjoyed it. Have you had a good Christmas? Had a good New Year? I had a lovely Christmas, thank you. Um, I'll I'll get into the um, the bits and pieces of it um, later on in more detail, but yeah, it was just really pleasant to uh, to be with the family and well, apart from my brother, um, and um, just sort of relax and wind. Uh, we went out for a curry actually uh, at our at our local, which was pleasant enough. We didn't even get home till about four, and then the day sort of just got away from us, uh, so we didn't really finish opening presents until midway through Boxing Day. And then it's just been a week of lazing around, enjoying the presents. Then New Year's was here. I spent about three hours of it walking in the dark with a friend, avoiding the ice, <laughs> uh, exploring all the back alleys of town, which was delightful, but also sort of worrying, seeing how everything's been built up over the years. Finding what were once sort of blind and, and dead alleyways now connect to whole new neighbourhoods that connect to parts of town that you'd usually have to walk in a horseshoe shape to get around. So, yeah, that was kind of interesting and depressing. We milled around the old high school as well, which was equally depressing. Um, <laughs> seeing how much that had all changed. They've they've kept the front face of it, but everything else has been pretty much demolished and rebuilt. And the buildings that were new when we started there back in 1999 are now relics of the past. Um and then just came home to the sort of the family quiz game that was wrapping up. Um, put up with Jules Holland's usual hoot nanny, and uh, and that was it really. So a pretty laid back week, but enjoyable nevertheless. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Just going back to the uh, school anecdote, I can totally appreciate that. My secondary school, so that's from 11 to 16, uh, from anyone for anyone outside the UK. Um, was demolished, so I, <laughs> so I, I can't, I can't. <laughs> with you in it. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and then my sixth form, which is sixteen to eighteen, uh, likewise, is just had this explosion of investment. It is now no longer recognisable. They've got a separate college building, and it's been built up with all new massive buildings, and it's just absolutely crazy how fast things seem to be going at the minute. Um, that you know. It, uh, I'd talked to my dad about his school and uh, it's still there standing exactly how it was from the 60s um, in a certain other area of, of town. So it's strange how different schools are affected in different ways. Uh, I haven't been there in 10, well, more than that, but uh, oh God, how long is it? Like 15 years or something? And uh, yeah, Oh, more than that, just, surely. Just, um well, let's let's, yeah, let's try and make us seem younger than we on. actually are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. In in the Rosyard days of two thousand eight, when we first attended secondary school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, time time flies and everything changes, and that's very depressing. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, very happy to hear that you had a good Christmas. Sorry, were you going to say something? 
Oh, no, I was just going to say, well, you could say it's good that they're investing in the youth, I guess. Oh, but the youth, eh. but today's youth are worse than they ever have been, surely. I don't know. Maybe the, the, the youth are worse, but the <laughs> amount of uh, money being thrown at them is more than ever. I just thought I'd throw a con- controversial grenade into the... <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? I mean, the shake-ups with um, the unspecified virus of unknown origin... Uh, has completely leveled the education system in a way, hasn't it? So if there's going to be a complete rebuild, um, Evangelion style of <laughs> the British educational system, then now would be the perfect time to sort of retool it, reshape it. That's what I'd be doing if I was, you know, like education minister involved in any policy making whatsoever. Uh, let's not go down the politics route. Oh, you'll just no, no. I, I'm just saying that it, it would make sense from sort of this standpoint while the schools are pretty much empty and while sort of education's really up in the air for a lot of young people now could be a good time to to just retool a a slightly outdated educational system all i know is i'm going to take my woods into uh, take take what take my kids into your woods woods, take my kids (laughs) take your woods to the kids (laughs) take my kids into the woods and just live entirely separately from society they'll be homeschooled and they'll be raised on food that i've grown and It'll be a manly time and goodness. (laughs) (laughs) They'll be raised with a healthy respect for bears, unlike the entitled kids of today. (laughs) (laughs) They'll be raised with Gaston as their icon. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Funnily enough, I was watching that the other day. Maybe I mentioned it on the other podcast, but um, yeah, finally getting Dad to watch uh, Beauty and the Beast. It was a magical moment. Oh yeah, please inform the listeners of that because that totally blew my mind you did mention that last week but we never got a chance to deep dive into it please please oh, tell so did. uh yeah so um my dad um is always sort of um talking with with misty eyes about disney but he's never actually watched about uh nine tenths of all their outputs um so earlier in lockdown he was trying to debate well should we watch mad max or aliens or how about Little Mermaid? They just threw that one out there. It's like, well, God, yeah, we'll do Little Mermaid. Why not? You'll get an education. Um, and he absolutely loved it. And instead of doing the sensible thing and watching the rest of the Disney Renaissance stuff from uh, from the 90s, he decided to double down on the live action stuff of more recent years. So regrettably, he watched the live action Beauty and the Beast before the, uh, the classic version. But uh, now that he knew he could tolerate the story... Um, over Christmas, I sat him down and got him to watch the original, and he really enjoyed it. I don't think he had much of a problem which version he watched, but at least now that gap in his uh, sort of mental library has been uh, plugged. But it was really good. I mean, who doesn't love Beauty and the Beast? It's a wonderful film. Charming, oh. colourful, full of great n- musical numbers. I think um, if, if you can, being as entirely objective as possible... I think that um, Beauty and the Beast is probably one of, if not Disney's, you know, greatest animated films. Uh, mm. That's a, might be a bit controversial, um, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I, th- I think that is the standard. I mean, some people might argue, I don't know, Frozen, perhaps from a sort of modern youth standpoint, or Moana, but Beauty and the Beast is still championed for a generation as the gold standard. Well, that's. That's where I'd put it. Uh, I think, you know, you can have your subjective favourites and things, but uh, just looking at it, as you say, from the musical numbers to um, all the other Disney finesses, it uh, it is really, really exquisite. And uh, you and I both had a bit of a Disney renaissance of our own a good few years ago where we mm. uh, were watching the films um, alongside each other. And, um, yeah, that, that was the one that stood out to me as just the... Uh, just put together so exquisitely um mm. i think there are, there are definitely problems with aladdin and the little mermaid and i don't like the lion king as much as everyone else does um but it, uh, it's a very front loaded film the lion king yeah um mm. but beauty and the beast for me is is that one that, that gets it right all the way through and, yeah and um yeah just just mastery of of, of children's animation and it's astounding how much they cram into. I think it's only about eighty minutes at most. It's it's a relatively um, brief film, um, but it doesn't feel rushed. It doesn't feel dragged out. Everything just feels so perfectly paced. Um, I, I forget where I'm going with that. 
<laughs> I, no, that's fine. I remember um, thinking that way when uh, watching Little Mermaid back. Is that Little mm. Mermaid's only it's only an hour fifteen, and and yeah, it, it it does have a lot of moments crammed into that hour fifteen. There is no filler at all in that film, and it's one of those things that's incredibly refreshing, especially when animated films these days. You you were talking about Frozen and Moana and uh, whatever else. Uh, Big Hero Six. I don't know. I'll throw that in there. Um, <laughs> they're all like coming up to two hours, I think, aren't they? Two hours mm. and over. Let's let's invest. They're definitely clocking about a hundred minutes. Hundred minutes, maybe at the yeah. very least. But the I um, think Zootopia probably clicks about two hours. Mm. Um, but the um, yeah, the the classic early nineties films. Uh, that they're brief and they pack a punch in that uh, mm. in that in that small runtime. Um, oh, that's sorry. Um, Carry on. No, 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 no. You go. I'm. Uh, I'm going to try and look for run times for modern. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, th- that's what I was going to say earlier, but my mind trailed off. Uh, the other thing about Beauty and the Beast, unlike every other film, I'm scanning my shelf now and looking at all, looking at uh, all of them, is it's the only Disney film that has the musical numbers um, spread throughout the entire runtime, with the exception oh. of maybe Hercules, which has a song right at the end. Most of them have. Most of their songs done by round about the time at the end of the second act. But Beauty and the Beast, you know, you get Kill the Beast right at the end. So it's consistently round about every seven to ten minutes you get a musical number. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Hmm. Um, and I think uh, uh, Little Mermaid, I think the last song is Kiss the Girl. And that's uh, literally the last thing that happens before the finale kicks off i think isn't it there's mm. no there's no finale uh song but i think there's only like 10 minutes to the film after that point anyway yeah that's <laughs> the crazy thing isn't it <laughs> it really again does. a lot happens in those 10 minutes but yeah uh, i know they wanted a i think they wanted um an end song for jafar in aladdin um mm. to see the end off and that never came through because they felt as though it um it just didn't fit um yeah i think it's a deleted scene on the uh the dvd and blu-ray and it, it's just it's jarring because yeah. like a lot of the disney villain songs they tend to speak sing if you know what i mean yeah um it, it's a it's a clunky song yeah it's certainly be prepared <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is, um, again, uh, Gaston has a song. D- does Gaston have a song? Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. oh you've had Gaston too, because he's got yeah, Kill the Beat. That, oh. that, that is exactly what I was thinking, because I was thinking at the start, he's in um, Bell's song, mm. and then he's in Kill the Beast, and then he's got his own at the end. So Gaston actually has three songs um, in Beauty and the Beast, which is really quite... Uh, insane to consider it's almost as if they designed it as a musical first and then built the film sort of around it goodness funny how that worked out revolutionary right so let me go back to this quickly so little mermaid is uh, an hour 23 so i was off by a little bit um (laughs) but, but at the same time i think this includes credits as well so you know shave a few they're not long credits they're not like today where it's like looking at a, a war memorial of names. <laughs> uh, How morbid a comparison. <laughs> it's it's damn as near it. We, we're we watching the, uh, the we just finished Iron Man 3 and you sit through the, the credits to watch the end, uh, the end stinger. And it's just, you get to a point, particularly by Endgame, where it's just nothing but like five rows of names filling top of the screen to bottom. And it just reels on and on for... <laughs> Oh. And then it does include uh, birth and, and date, <laughs> birth, birth and death dates. Um, so, yes. so Little Mermaid's uh, an hour 23. Beauty and the Beast is an hour 24. Mm. Oh, crap. I was meant to look up Aladdin. Uh, and then we fast forward to, let's say, Frozen 2013, an hour 42. Uh, Moana is an hour 47. And Zootopia is an hour 48. So, yeah, they, they're cramming on an extra uh, 20 minutes um, mm. or so. Uh, Zootopia isn't even a musical, actually, is it? No, not a single musical number. In fact, Zootopia is the only one that would benefit from having a bit more runtime in it, to be honest. All the others feel like Padder, apart from Tangled. Um, oh, Tangled. But that's a good one. 
Yeah, good old Tangled. Let me have well, that is just the last musical number with, um, is it for the first time? That's that's around about the hour mark, isn't it? So then they sort of give up from there. Um, the so I'm no, so the the final to... musical in Tangled is the uh, the ballad. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, is, that's is, the one, isn't it? Is that the launching one? the lanterns? Yeah. Um... For the first time in forever. Uh, no, that's not that oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> I could have that was the one they're both singing about the first time they're feeling love. Anyway, um, first time in forever is uh, Frozen, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. I don't know. I, people all are I remember absolutely is... mad listening to this now. Hang on, hang on. I know. We, we, we're we're going to get to the bottom of this. Oh, these days, uh, is it now that I found you? What's it called? Tangles. Now that I no. found you. <laughs> we, we, we should have researched that. <laughs> Why is it giving me Liam Gallagher? Or, I see yeah, the light. Yeah, I, for the first time in forever. No, for the first time. What? For the first oh. time in forever. I guess it's a line within the I see the light. Yeah, for the first time in forever is Frozen. Um, it's at the start of Frozen, I think. For the first, yeah, it's yeah. Just, just trust me. First time in forever is Frozen, right. and <laughs> I see the light. Is uh, tangled. <laughs> How do we even get to this topic? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's the last song in Tangled, which it still then has quite a bit to go until the end of the film. So again, it's like you get to just over halfway in the film, and then the songs stop because then it's like okay, now mm. we need to focus on the story, which is one thing that Disney, since uh, Howard Ashman passed away, hasn't really. Um, done a good job at rectifying it. As we were saying, Beauty and the Beast and uh, Little Mermaid have sort of perfected that and then they got away from it. Sorry, carry on. It it really throws off the pacing. Mm. Um, Even Mulan, uh, I think it's about 15 minutes before the end of the film. Um, I don't know, maybe 20. Uh, I think Girl Worth Fighting For is the last song. And that's before they fight the the Hun for the first time. Mm. I don't know Mulan well enough to be honest. Um, it's not bad actually. I've I've gone back and rewatched it in the wake of the uh, <laughs> the live action version, and um, it's a lot of fun. It's perfectly charming. It's yeah. it's no golden age, but it's certainly it's it's a lot better than pretty much everything apart from Lilo and Stitch that followed it for a while. Uh, what was Mulan? 98, 99? I thought it was 99, because then they had Fantasia 2000, and then The Empress New Groove. It was 98. Uh, was it 98? It was 98. Oh, damn. Yeah. What, I, it was Hercules 97? It must have been, because Tarzan was after Mulan. Yeah, Mulan, uh, Hercules was the final one, really, that I showed an interest in as a kid, and then after that was, uh, yeah, I was approaching teenagehood and was more interested in drugs and whatever else 12 year olds are interested in (laughs) drugs and shrek (laughs) um so yeah the summer of 1997 was hercules and that was actually an hour and a half so they are getting a bit longer even then yeah Uh, that film it doesn't feel it I, i watched it only two months ago because uh, I was trying to get my then girlfriend into um, all the sort of Miss Disney of, uh, well, of her uh, pre childhood. Um, then girlfriend but... says it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't appreciate the classic. She had to go. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's good. Um, it, it's not great, but it's it's certainly good. <laughs> uh, what are we talking about? Mulan. Hercules. Oh, Hercules. Oh, no, I love Hercules. It's... Yeah, I preferred Mulan to Hercules on rewatching it, and oh, I wow. loved Hercules as a kid because of all the the Greek um, mythology, which I'm a big big nerd for. Yeah. So as a kid, Hercules hit all the spots, but yeah, on uh, on rewatch, I've preferred Mulan a lot more. Wow, surprised me. Mulan never really seemed to have much personality. Um, I need to be careful what I say because Mulan's my girlfriend's like favorite film of all time. Um... <laughs> Maybe by comparison of the new films, suddenly she's. You know, she's gushing with personality by comparison. <laughs> um, yeah, 
Let's reel it back in. What were we going to talk about? Um, Christmas. We did the bees. Christmas. Good, okay, good Christmas. Blah, 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 blah. Welcome How to the your- Christmas Vacuum Podcast. Um, yeah, it was, it was fine. It was fine. It was largely uneventful. We, um, because um, I currently live in a household with uh, many people, include in my family, uh, including my nephew, my two-year-old nephew, we have to follow a routine which means that uh, generally things throughout the day don't change too much. Um, He has his, uh, funnily enough, he has his Disney films on the TV and Tangled's on a lot and Frozen's on a lot and what else is on? Moana. So all the the films you just mentioned, all the modern ones, uh, because he doesn't yet appreciate um, the classics i suppose it's it's funny how the new digital animated are more appealing to children rather than the old traditional cartoons um i, I don't know if the flasher or or i suppose they're more dynamic aren't they because of how they could be filmed um so yeah, yeah he 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 likes all those and so they're pretty much on a constant cycle which makes it difficult to to really do anything different um uh so yeah that's 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 pretty much been been my christmas it's been filmed with uh lots of modern disney <laughs> which is probably skewed the way that i could talk about them really it's like oh god no <laughs> uh, well, you'd never know they could start to grow on you eventually that'd be the horrible thing well we've we had that point that point came and passed and now it's just entirely indifference um, <laughs> Yeah, you're like the animated features of the uh, the mid two thousands. Exactly. Uh, so I try and just blank them out, so that one day in a few years I can maybe go back to Tangled and enjoy it again. Mm. Um, <laughs> which I, it's one of those things like I know I definitely did enjoy it, so I'm going to hold that opinion as <laughs> this is how I feel about that film. Um, but yeah, when you uh, when you hear the songs a dozen times a day, it. Uh, it starts to get to the point where you have to zone them out and forget about those mm. past affections. Uh, Frozen, I've always hated, so that's fine. I, I don't mind yeah. hating. Well, it. Apart from the uh, the troll song, I mean, who doesn't love the the entirely catchy troll song? If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is seriously but, like one of the worst songs in the uh, ever in in the Disney repertoire. I think. Oh, it's just terrible. Does anybody know the lyrics to that? Apart from "Fix the Upper," and then it's just "Jabba Dabba 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 Dabba." Uh, Moana um, is a film we we watched Moana actually didn't we? You, we did. You yeah, we watched, watched that and um, Zootopia. Zootopia, that's a fact, didn't we? Yeah, um, yeah. I liked Moana when we watched it. It grew on more and more as it was on in the background, um, and then it went to hating it. And now, you know, as I say, indifference. So, <laughs> oh, just you wait until uh, the live-action Little Mermaid, and you can enjoy Melissa McCarthy singing "Poor Unfortunate Soul." Oh, please don't tell me that's true. Is that it... is true. This was going to be the bit of news I was going to drop, but oh uh, the... no! I'm horribly, horribly sorry to say that. I mean, I love Little Mermaid, and I know how much you love that film. Um, and already, I know exactly what we're going to get from Melissa McCarthy doing Ursula. Oh, no. It's going to be painful. Oh, this is this actually broke. When did this break? This broke last summer. How did we not hear this? I, th- I think we repressed it. I-, I seem to remember rumblings of it, but I think it was more the controversy over Ariel at the time overshadowed it. Right. But now that, that the festering has set into a, a rot... And uh, and the rot is shaped exactly like Melissa McCarthy's face. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can you can see how the entire film is going to play out. You can hear every greechy ad libbed attempt at humour, and and her rendition of that song. And oh god. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. I'm just sorry. That's funny, thank you. I'm reading yeah, through these you, articles yeah. uh, in some desperate hope that uh, that it's not true. And it it's is true. true. It, who else could they get to play her? Well, I mean, the uh, the original origins of the character, I think um, Harold Ashman wanted Ursula to be voiced by a drag, by a classic drag artist, didn't oh, he? Uh, well, she was based on Divine, if you yeah, remember yeah, yeah. Divine. Yeah. Mm. And... Um, I think 
that was more in line with what he wanted um, the the voice to be. And then uh, the the person that he singled out couldn't do it or something, so they went with uh, forgot a name, forgot a name. I'll get it. Um, they went with the actual uh, female voice actor of uh, of Ursula, and it, it it is a stunning performance. That's one of the things you've got it to say. Really about, is. Uh, her, her voice is captivatingly unique. Like a lot of the uh, the Disney villains of the nineties, all the best ones had really memorable voices, but. Yeah, um, I, I it, wish I could remember a voice actress's name. It's, um, uh, it's Pat Carroll, and uh, Pat she Carroll. delivers unquestionably one of the great uh, Disney villain uh, voices, performances. Um, yeah, I, I think Poor Unfortunate Souls is up there with one of the uh, finest Disney songs, and that is all through the delivery of the performance. Mm. It's it's the way it builds that crescendo. You know, when the song first starts, you think, this isn't quite as punches i remember but it builds and builds and builds to that final rendition of poor unfortunate souls and the music swells and booms and the lighting becomes more dramatic and everything's so much more frantic it's 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 perfectly paced and perfectly delivered uh as only early disney films could manage uh yeah um although to, to be fair you've got to say most of of that film when you consider it from that uh, perspective is pretty perfect. Uh, Jodie mm. Jody Benson became pretty much the quintessential princess, Disney princess of the, and although that's, that's a, another controversial because Belle and uh, Paige O'Hara did really well as, as Belle. But um, I think Jodie Benson owns the role, doesn't she? Do you oh, remember the, um, the, the teaser trailer for Lilo and Stitch was leaked and it was like uh, Stitch invading all the, you know, like the, the iconic scenes from films. And when uh, Jodie Benson was told that, yeah, you, you're going to sort of splash Stitch with your tail, she went, oh, that's so mean. And she was <laughs> heartbroken that her character could be portrayed like that. And that was, what, 15 years after the fact, 12 yeah. years later? I, oh, she's she's daringly wonderful. I That was um, something I was going to touch on um, a little earlier, and I completely forgot. So I'm glad you reminded me. Uh, one of the films that my nephew's been watching as well that um, my sister's put on is um, uh, the third Little Mermaid film. She's uh, tried to get him into the songs because the songs are very jazzy. Uh, mm. And um, yeah, I, I was thinking about how uh, the third Little Mermaid film, Ariel's Beginning, is it? which again, we're both huge fans of. Everyone else in the world hates it. Uh, <laughs> they, they think it's the worst straight to DVD uh, Disney film. But uh, Which is saying something. yeah, but uh, you, my, uh, you, my sister, and I absolutely adore that film. And as I say, I think we're the only people in the world. Um, well, it's all down to Jodie Benson. That it's mostly her at the end of the day. Um, I just think it's a charming film. It reminds me more of a Ghibli film in the sense. Oh no, it does have a villain. What am I, talking? I was going to say there's no villain, but there totally is a villain. <laughs> yeah, it almost sets up a pre Ursula, doesn't it? Which would have been more interesting, I think. Um, much as I don't like villains backstories being over explained it, it did feel a bit like they were going to be setting up how ursula became sort of banished and, and cursed by neptune and instead they just sort of went with a a prototype version of her which didn't make much sense king and she triton. had a manatee for a best friend king triton king triton not neptune oh sorry yeah i was gonna say king namor <laughs> 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 even though he runs Atlantis so, ew, what a mess there, we've got too many sea gods yeah crossover of the year um, yeah um, it could happen. yeah it, uh, she, she does have a manatee uh, best friend sidekick thing I don't know I just felt as though it was sufficiently understated while being uh, a charming character driven film um, I don't know if you remember the second film but I do that yes, is with Ursula's crazy sister. Ursula's crazy sister. And, <laughs> and Ariel's pushed to the back of the film and it's a daughter that takes centre stage. And it's just a lot of, you know, nonsense. It, it is just the most generic um, daughter takes the mantle and fights old arch nemesis sort of. Um... Yeah, it's what they did with a lot of those straight to. Although it does have, and I remember texting you at the time because I burst out laughing, um, Flounder comes back and he's fat. Oh, and that's basically... right. Looking like uh, Millhouse, uh, Millhouse's dad, <laughs> and 
<laughs> that, that was fantastic. The utter contempt they had for Flounder. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, but just to finish my point, <laughs> um, so that film was almost 20 years after the original. And um, it's fantastic longevity, uh, really, to to um, you know to to still maintain so much of that essence twenty years later. Uh, mm. We were talking about Paige O'Hara's Bell, and I think she really struggles. I don't know if you've ever seen her uh, recently. Uh, not recent. Oh, we're going way way back, well over a decade. Yeah, um, she she's. I think she's done Bell in a few things, but she doesn't feel right. Uh, mm. Whereas Jody Benson always comes back and um, you know just nailed it every time. Uh, granted, she's been. I mean, you think that she's only done Little Mermaid twenty years ago, but I'm sure that if you actually let's do that, let's click on her filmography. Well, she was done the television series from well, the yeah. sequels, all the video games, The Kingdom Hearts, um, all the animated Disney uh, video games and interactive services. You totally stole uh, my point there. That's exactly what I sorry. was going to say. <laughs> stole it. You stole it. She also she's in uh, Hercules, the TV show, the animated show as Helen of really? Troy. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. she was in the Batman Beyond TV series. She was in what else is she in? She's basically stuck around uh, Disney. It seems like Disney um, have paid for her career. <laughs> um, Fair enough. She's perfectly charming in the role, so why not? Absolutely. And then she was in the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Ah, oh, I think recently as well, the uh, the voice actor who played Grimm died, I think. Oh, don't tell me that. Oh. Yeah, it's right in the, uh, the credits of Crash Bandicoot. It uh, it fades out and it, uh, it has the voice actor who's been replacing him. But... Hang on. I, Hang on. I just want to check this. Because, uh, whoever played Aku Aku died. All right. You're, uh, you, you faded out a little bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I sort of. Um, I'm trying to find the Wikipedia page to check my. Well, uh, Grimm was played by uh, Greg Eagles, and he's very much still alive. He's only fifty. Ah, uh, okay. Maybe it's the original Akuaku or the original creator of the Bandicoot or something. But someone died. Someone died. <laughs> <laughs> someone died. <laughs> Breaking, Wait, died. <laughs> Breaking news. Uh, yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, let's kick on into the show. That was all just preamble. That's like thirty-five minutes of uh, of just preamble stuff. Uh, you've you've sent me a load of things to uh, to bring up on screen for the good people watching and listening. Uh, what would you like me to bring up first? What uh, What would you like to uh, talk to us about? Uh, well, seeing as I brought it up only, uh, only um, about a minute ago, I might as well talk about Crash Bandicoot. Cool. Yep, that's the one. Go for it. So, uh, for my sort of main Christmas present, I... Bear with me. Um, I got the new Crash Bandicoot game, which truly was about time. We've been mm -hmm. waiting so long for new Bandicoot material. The last one would have been, uh, I think, Mind Over Mutant, and that was in 2000. Nine, maybe two, no. Two thousand eight is when we were in our um, our student house, and by that point, the series had just evolved into this like open world brawling mess. I didn't know what it was. Um, so yeah, they've they've just come back and said no, nothing exists outside of the third game. We're we're resetting it. This is the the official fourth game, and it's a lot of fun. Um, clearly, Toys for Bob have grown up with with the franchise and wanted to do right by it but my god it's difficult Th this game is for like three plus but some of the levels are dark souls levels of infuriatingly difficult <laughs> and i'm not being hyperbolic in in that regard um th this game is a stone cold bitch when it wants to be um I i'm getting better at it <laughs> but um <laughs> The the usual token used to be that you had um, you play your levels and you'd have collect all smash all the boxes you get a gem go through a secret path you'll get a coloured gem finish it in a in a time trial you'll get a relic now they've added in like collect all the wumper fruit break all the boxes find a hidden gem find the hidden path um, 
that leads to a hidden gem. And if you can complete the level with three or less deaths, that's how you get the sixth gem. And then there's the inverted mode, which takes the level, does something weird with it with a filter, flips it on its axis, and you've got to do it all again. And some of these levels, it took me a hundred attempts to do the final segment between the checkpoint and the finale. A hundred attempts to do that segment run, which took about 30 seconds once I nailed it. And that's not including the 30 deaths leading up to it, just to get to the final checkpoint. And it's just madness. <laughs> um, but uh, it actually allows you to unlock costumes as you go. So there's incentive to keep playing and get the gems. Uh, rather than just going, well, the game's finished now, I can move on. Uh, trophies be damned. Um, so it's good. It, it's really, really good. Um, a lot of care and attention. But it's, some choices, like certain playable characters, are just not designer-friendly at all. Um, but it is nice to have a, a Crash Bandicoot game again for the first time in, pff, I think it's 22 years since the, the third game came out. Wow. So, yeah, um, I'm eagerly awaiting a sequel to this, um, by which point I should maybe get about another 5% of it done. <laughs> it's it's magnificent. I, I grew up on Bandicoot. I've probably mentioned it a couple of times in the past um, on this channel. But, um, yeah, it, it was the main event that I was looking forward to more than anything else this Christmas, and I avoided everything to do with the game outside of the trailer just to avoid any spoilers. And, um, yeah, loved it. And that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Would you like to hear how PSM profiles rate the difficulty of the trophies? To, oh, I to get the plat. Yeah, I bet it's something like zero point four percent. Being generous. Well, I mean, they they rank the difficulty of of the plat to get the plat, and the difficulty is nine out of ten. It requires four playthroughs and at least a hundred hours. Um, and I yep. imagine that's that's if you're competent and know what you're doing. So I can believe that. Yeah, that sounds extreme. Did you um watch any of the Only Plays um episodes of Crash Four before you play? Oh no, you said you didn't. Did you? You well, stayed with. Now, uh, not even reminded me. Um, but I mean, yeah, I've managed to get one time trial relic, which uh, for for the uninformed is you've got to do the the level without any checkpoints and complete it within a set amount of time. Uh, you can get. Yeah, standard sapphire, gold, and then platinum. And one of the trophies is get all the levels done with the platinum relic. And I, I, I just don't know. I have no idea how that is even remotely possible. Jesus Christ, that does sound extreme. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never managed to one hundred percent the uh, the third game, which does require all the. Oh wait, no, I did once. I tell a lie. Yeah, we did manage to, with the help of my brother and cousins, get a hundred and five percent on Crash Bandicoot three. Um, but yeah, that is not going to be remotely possible with this one. It is fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, the current uh, plat percentage is three point three six percent, and that's on PlayStation Pro. So that's among the hardcore. And then among the everyday public, it's zero point three percent. So uh, <laughs> that's a pretty hardcore. Uh, yeah, platinum to get right there. Um, I'm just scrolling through. Earn all the clear gems. 4.95% of people mm -hmm. have got that. Um, earn all Insanity Perfect Relics. 3.98% have got that. <coughs> earn all the Platinum Time Trial Relics. 3.52%. So, phew, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to, to get the uh, those perfect relics, um, uh, the, the perfect achievements, you've got to complete all of the, the previously outlined uh, prerequisites in the level at once. Oh, good God. You see, this is... So, I'm... yeah, I've got, I've got three out of 30. Yeah, this is why I don't go near Crash Bandicoot games. <laughs> used to be this bad. Pardon? So this is, uh, they never used to be this bad. They used to be challenging, but never impossible. It seems like um, what happened with the remasters kind of uh lit a fire in the idea of being insanely difficult um mm. let me put this in there because when that came out there was a lot of surprise from people just how hard it was and i think um i think they must have been a bit 
uh, turned on by that idea of creating a Dark Souls version of of, of a platformer, <laughs> like like you said earlier. Um, mm. Well, th- most of that was down to their own uh, the desire to rush out because between the first and the third game, obviously technological developments had, had moved on, um, but they mapped the um, essentially the system of the third game and transposed the first game onto it. Mm. So all the hitboxes were completely different. So you were still playing the f- first game like the first game, but it was handling like the third game, and that's why it was so stupidly difficult. Uh, I see. Uh, in addition to being stupidly difficult anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that that was the main reason that it was so insanely difficult, uh, particularly the first game out of the three, because it was playing on uh, an engine that hadn't been invented yet. Yeah, the difficulty rating for the first remaster is 7 out of 10. Um, but mm. they do say it only takes 18 hours to do. So, um, yeah, I suppose it's better than 100 hours, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm perfectly happy with the amount of trophies I've got. I I know I'll never get any better than that, but I, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, as long as you're uh, having a good time. Are you close to completing it, or is there plenty left oh. to do? No, there's there's plenty left to do. I've got um, 82%, which isn't bad for the span of a week, mm. given how much is going on. Um, I know there's a few more gems here and there that I can that I can snag, um, but mostly I'm just trying to get the costumes at the moment. Ah, very, I know uh, how much of a costume hunter you are. It's one of those great thrills. So that's uh, mm. that's cool. What what are they? Keeps... So good. Oh, sorry. No, no, you carry on. No, I was just going to say, what type of costumes are they? Are they retro costumes or just kind of... Uh, there's... Um, soup top costumes. There's like, the original uh, like polygons of Crash and Coco, and then there's, I don't know, them just as pirates and painters and dinosaurs. And uh, the one I really want, it, typically it's the final level, and you've got to get every single gem in the level, or 12 of them, uh, to get like mutant bat versions of Crash and Coco. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really want, but there's no chance. Absolutely no chance. Uh, and even the, um, sorry, uh, the original design when he was going to be called Wally Wombat, that's one of the unlockable skins. Um, oh, cool. But there, there's some asinine uh, means of getting a hold of it, which I'm I'm not going to be able to get. Um, so I've written that off. But I don't want to cheat by looking it up on YouTube because I want it to be a great mystery for me. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. that will have been your highlight of 2020, then I imagine. Uh, Pretty like much. Yeah. I mean, there's there's been there's been some good stuff this year. A lot of it has uh, been more throwbacks that I've only just been able to catch up on. But yeah, this has been a long time coming. And when it sort of surprise dropped the announcement, that was uh, that was exciting times, and it's it's lived up to the the hype. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy that you're uh, that you're enjoying yourself. When uh, when Matt and I were discussing what we wanted to do for this episode, we didn't know if we wanted to, wanted it to be a retrospective or a retrospective of, of the year, uh, talking about what we enjoyed, what we didn't enjoy, and deep diving into all that kind of stuff. Uh, I I did a lot of research and suddenly realised that I didn't like particularly much <laughs> much in twenty twenty. It seems like absolutely everything was a disaster in one way or another. And and I was uh, I was on Den of Geek the other day, and they have a they have three articles. They have no four, in fact. They have best movies, best TV shows, best games, and best geek moments, or something like that. And uh, it's it was an experience like when you put Radio One on for the first time, and you realise that oh my god, I'm not young anymore. I don't like modern music. <laughs> This is the best they have to offer. Yeah, because I was I was scrolling through all this list, and I'm just like, this is all just trash. This doesn't appeal to me in any way, shape, or form. And then it suddenly dawned on me that, um, I'm sure you you'll remember years, well, not even years ago, but, um, for, uh, a period, if anyone wanted to know anything about a new TV show or, um, you know, what was up and coming and what was worth investing time in. I, I always felt like I, I I knew what TV shows were worth watching, and so I, I'm sure I gave you recommendations, and I'd, I'd always give friends recommendations of of what TV shows they might want to 
get involved in and, and check out, I suddenly realised that I'm just so completely dis disillusioned with the modern status of TV and stuff that I've just stopped watching it. And um, I think the only thing that's really grabbed my attention uh, of recently is a show called Dark. And that actually finished last year. Uh, it finished its third and final season. And it's a, it's a, I think I've told you about it before, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if you could, you don't remember. Oh, like, no, I remember you, I remember this being brought up. I just can't remember the details. Yeah, it's like a, um, it's like a mix between Lost and, I hesitate to say Twin Peaks, because I compare Twin Peaks to everything, but I, I think it is. It's like Lost, Twin Peaks, and Donnie Darko, essentially. The, the three main influences it seems to all smash together um and it is really good i still need to watch the final season as i say that came out towards the end of of last year uh but i watched it last year and um yeah that's the only thing which struck me as original and interesting and uh and, and kept my attention e everything else just is so loaded with um you know ulterior motives and you, you know you can't just enjoy media for a sake of enjoyment anymore everything's got to be saying something or you know geared a certain way and it's um as i say it's just completely turned me off pretty much everything this year and i think that's why i've um shifted my attentions more maybe to just youtube and just you know the channels i enjoy on mm. on youtube and i'd say that's probably been more what my 2020 is about even my video gaming habits have died down a lot in 2020 after spiking massively in 2019 um and n not that there aren't amazing games out there to be played um but uh you know it just the enthusiasm affects the rest of your consuming of media i suppose um, yeah but yeah so um what did i yeah, as I said, there's not really anything specifically from 2020 that I could shout from the treetops and say this is this is what really stood out. Um, I mean, there's things I've managed to finally catch up on in 2020 uh, that have been found. I mean, the the Harley Quinn animated show that is one of my favourite things of all time. Now that is an absolutely fantastic show uh, from when is it? I think it came out in 2018, um, and. Uh, just barnstormed that that was pretty much all me and my brother really uh wanted to watch and talked about for a while uh yeah i i re you you recommended that i watched the first episode and for some reason again never got never got around to the rest of it but yeah the first episode was good it was really good in uh in the second or third episode when she's striding out on her own they bring um uh robin comes into it and it, it's the uh the damien gray the younger rob been and they've essentially got a six-year-old to voice him and um he decides <laughs> on himself that he'll become like harley's arch nemesis and it's just like it's it, she's at an all-time low and now this child is going on talk shows and talking about how is <laughs> how they're like sworn nemeses and just grinding her reputation into the dirt <laughs> <laughs> every time he speaks it's hilarious <laughs> is it in the third season now second season um the third season's been greenlit uh, okay i don't really know where they're going to go with it to be honest season two sort of rounded things off perfectly um so we'll see um i'm excited for a third season but i i i'm scratching my head going well where can they go from this mm. well that's cool something something mm. to look forward to uh when everything else is so trash <laughs> 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 uh, um yeah, uh, you've uh, sent me a Persona Five image. Is that? Uh, oh yeah. Is that, uh, that was, that was when I was trying to work out what this um, episode was going to be about. Really, um, I think I got sidelined by something else. I think it was Doctor Who or something, which um, was going to take its place. But just in terms of good things that happened this year, because it would have been so easy to just be pessimistic and talk about oh all the terrible things and all the woke culture and everything else but there has been some good stuff and persona 5 getting the royale edition has definitely been one of the uh, the better things yeah very true um it, i think it is currently um uh, sitting atop the metacritic rating as the best rpg of all time or something the uh specifically oh. the 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 royale version uh which is very exciting um i held off 
I, w- I was literally going to play P- Persona 5, and then they announced the Royale edition, and then I was like, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll just hang on there, I guess. Delighted and depressed to know that they haven't just copy-pasted the trophies over. They've completely redesigned the trophies, switched some of them out. Um, so there is a reason to still have the standard edition. Ah, well, it might be that I go back and uh, and play it all over again in that case, then. Uh, I've, I've still got to buy, fight the final boss. And, um, yeah, you know, the idle days before Christmas where you finish one game and go, well, I'll probably have some games for Christmas, so I shouldn't get too invested. Maybe I'll finish Persona. Um, and I looked at the, the walkthrough for the final boss, and pretty much to a man, every single walkthrough was at least an hour long. Jesus so, Yeah, the, the bosses are insane. Um, so I thought, uh, well, sod that. I'll try it again, maybe over the protracted summer we've got coming up before trying the Royale Edition. That's a- but you're going to love it. It is an incredible game. That is so good to hear, because uh, you didn't like it at all when you first started it, I remember. It took me a while. Um, it's a bit like a bit like anything, really. Not so Republic I had the same issue with. It's It was such a different kind of game in terms of the me- mechanics and, and trying to work out how everything worked. Mm. Uh, and I came up to the second boss, I think, and I just couldn't beat him for love nor money. Um, then I understood how it worked, and I just spent pretty much an entire spring playing it through to uh, uh, the final boss. Mm. So, yeah, once, once you get a hang of it, it is the best. It really is. It's incredibly addictive. Oh, that's awesome. I was actually considering just um, looking forward now to 2021, uh, changing gears slightly. I uh, I think I'm still mopping up Doom, uh, which I've been doing very slowly, but enjoying myself. Every now and then, I'll just do a, a like completely. I'll spend like an, an hour and a half just completely going through one level, and mm-hmm. uh, and completing it all and getting everything, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, so I've got a few levels of that to do, uh, and then a bit of mopping up, and then I think I might actually jump into the original Final Fantasy VII, which is something I've been wanting to do for, oh, I don't know, uh, fifteen years. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to finally getting around to doing that. And I think we had this conversation uh, when the remake came out as to, well, do you just play the remake? Can you play the remake? Or do you need to uh, play the original first? Will playing the original first spoil the remake? And I've seen mm. it a number of times that people do recommend uh, play the original. And then apparently the remake means a lot more. Um, you know whatever whatever that means so uh, i've <laughs> taken that advice and uh, yeah looking forward to, to playing it through the playstation 4 version uh without wanting to say they've added cheats they added cheats <laughs> um really it's yeah so it's the first quality of life upgrade is that you can double speed it which is just amazing um so everyone runs at double speed and the second is that you can turn on uh, limit breaks, which I think is like a an ultra uh, deluxe finisher. And those are just available whenever, rather than building up to them in a battle. Uh, so you, you can literally like one hit KO every battle you're in, I think. Uh, that might be completely wrong, but that's how I understand it. And apparently they introduced um, those abilities uh, for people who just want to play the story. So it goes from like a 100-hour game to a 40-hour game or something like that. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it is difficult. I mean, when we all had like a summer off, well, a, a year off, um, that is spending that amount of time on a game is all good. But now that life is possibly resuming, as it was, it's like, when am I going to get 100 hours? To- yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And it's especially when you've got uh, multiple games on the shelf that all demand that level of attention. Uh, mm. The backlog is is creeping up, and uh, and you still keep. I don't know about you, but I keep an eye on the games that I don't have, <laughs> and look at them as though they're in my shelf. Yes. Um, like I, I still <laughs> like to, I, I'd like to see what uh, Death Stranding's all about. I suppose, even though I'm really yeah, yeah. So I'm a bit unsure about that, but everyone says you'll either love it or you'll hate it, and it's definitely worthwhile experiencing it. So, yeah, but that's that's like majorly long as well, from what I understand. 
Yeah, I don't they say it takes the first 10 hours to actually get to the part where the game gets good? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's like this part 20 hours into the game where everything flips and it becomes like a new game. You'll love it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's literally and what I've heard. That ruins it, knowing that, but... <laughs> Uh, let's have a look here. Let's see. Last time I checked, it was still about thirty pounds. Um, oh, it's uh, it's been uh, a tenner over Christmas. Uh, really? Oh, okay. It's dropped down to seventy at the moment. Yeah, in the Black Friday sales, it was it was definitely ten pounds in a few places. Damn. I, I imagine it'll be it'll definitely go down to that price. Uh, that's that's the one thing I've yeah. learned from uh, gaming over all these years is that never think. Never bite and think that's the lowest the game's going to go because give it a few months, it'll always go lower. And I've been bitten so many times. In fact, I think we've had this conversation before on the show where um, I, like a couple of months after Mirror's Edge Catalyst came out, it was £25 and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, I need to get that now because if, if that goes back <laughs> up in price. And uh, sure enough, you can now get it off the, off the digital store for £3. So... <laughs> um, that one stinks, especially because it's not a good game. Uh, Death Stranding takes 100 hours to get the Platinum. So, uh, yeah. But it is very easy. It's 3 out of 10. So. Um, oh, well, that's some... Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a leisurely Platinum in those 100 hours. Uh, so, yeah, what do I have to look forward to to complete in 2020? This is going to be... This just sh shows how embarrassingly shallow my exclusive PS4 gaming has been so far. I really want to get to <laughs> God of War, Resident Evil 2, The Last Guardian, Persona 5, The Witcher, um, Detroit Become Human, Nino Kuni 2, Shenmue 3, uh, and then Metal Gear Solid Definitive Edition is a coin flip because, yeah, that's another massive, massive game. Uh, that's quite difficult. I yeah, I, did I tell you the story of uh, when I tried that one? No, please tell me. Uh, I, I got it, again, dirt cheap. I mean, considering the game is about 200 hours long, I got it for about a fiver, brand new. Um, oh. And um, so I, I put it off and off and off because it was one of those big, epic scale games where, you know, you want to be able to sit down and truly immerse yourself in it. Um, I finally got through the first 20-minute uh, cutscene started playing the game and there's a, an achievement for like doing it stealthy sneaky sneaky um i was trying to read all the the materials within to work out how the game works uh walked down a path immediately got spotted and got shot game over <laughs> had to then sit through the entire opening credit scene again oh my uh started the game immediately walked off a cliff and died <laughs> and the scene started again and that was about three years ago and i just said right fuck it turn it off uninstalled it and i've never touched it again <laughs> <laughs> um which one is the because there are two parts to metal gear solid 5 there's phantom pain and ground zeros which is which can you remember uh, uh okay so ground zeros is the first one which is the short one it's like the prelude yeah and that takes 15 hours to plat so that's fine uh, and then, yeah, like you were saying, the Phantom Pain, which is the main game of Metal Gear Solid Five, is 130 hours, and uh, has a difficulty rating of five out of ten. Um, it's a, a game, a similar game to what you were just describing that I nearly jacked in. Um, that has does the exact same thing, but even worse, I think, is uh, <laughs> Nia. Uh, yes, Nia. <laughs> Now, I always get this wrong. It's, it's either Automata or Automata. Is it Automata? Near Automata? I think it's Automata. Automa um, just going off what I've heard of the people pronounce it as. Whatever it is, uh, Near is just, oh my God. Never have a game that I've initially loved so much nearly got <laughs> done at 180s quick and just like tell with this. Because um, the opening of that game is sensational. It is stellar. It just throws everything at you. And um, and then what you find out, if you're unlucky, is that, oh, it's insta-kill. <laughs> and, uh, and if you die, you have to start right back from the very beginning. And the opening segment, playing it for the first time, is probably about an hour. Maybe, maybe I don't know if... Uh, uh, is it, that sounds about right, yeah. Until the oil rig boss, maybe even two, hour and a half, perhaps. Yeah, and so... 
I died at the old root boss, I think, three times. And it's not even like later in the later stages of the boss. It's the very first stage where you're still trying to figure out his attacks because it's like it's got a, like yep. a rolling maneuver and you think how can i avoid this and sure enough before you even realize it he's like crushed you and crushed got you to, again got to start from the beginning so that infuri I, I respected it and i loved it but it infuriated me all, all at the same time <laughs> um it's like ha ah, i see the game you're playing i don't like it but i respect it um <laughs> and so yeah, and then going through that game all over again, and as I say, it was probably my fourth attempt, and that was definitely going to be my last attempt. Um, but never experienced anything like that before, and it will always be memorable because of that. And yeah, uh, it's it's as I say, infuriating but cool. Hey, I had no idea. I thought you loved it from beginning to end, and um, maybe just speaks to my amazing talents. Um, but uh, I never experienced the permadeath in the first section. I is it only the first section that features in them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, because so I was going to say when you fight the um, the the white haired typical JRPG guy towards the end of the first section, that I died on once or twice, and and that just reset to pretty much the beginning of the boss fight. So um, the huh, okay. can you, can you find me an image of that? Because I can't uh, remember yeah, that. You fight the crashed UFO. Crashed UFO. Oh, that's in the main game itself. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just talking about the 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 intro. So, so you yeah. didn't die during the intro? I, I just got very lucky. I must have been very close a couple of times, but I was so, you know, when you're so bad at something that it, it's almost like if you're really clumsy, you're you're never quite on your feet, but you'll never quite fall over. Yeah, it's not like that. I I was so bad at the game that I, I sort of overcompensated and managed to avoid fucking up too colossally because I knew how bad I was. Um, so yeah, by the skin of my teeth, I managed to beat the uh, the rig bo uh, rig boss fight. Yeah, without too much difficulty. Well, no, sorry, with difficulty, but without having to uh, restart. Um, I'm just I put it into Google near intro permadeath and yeah it's just like a massive list of people <laughs> all getting incredibly frustrated that uh, that they, they keep dying on this on this prologue section and, uh, and having to go back from to the beginning um Jeez. and <laughs> and then a lot of other people saying just turn it on to easy <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then set it on to normal or hard later and i think that's what what i must have no i played it on normal and it never dawned mm. on me just to switch it to easy. Um, <laughs> that felt so cheating. Yeah. But that was a special, wasn't it? That that really was something truly subversive. Uh, subversive. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I've died ten times. I've died three times. I suck at this <laughs> game. I hate this game. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't help that it keeps switching up the gaming style. It begins with like a hack and slash, and then it turns into a, a jet fight simulator. Uh, like... Yeah, it, uh, well, I mean, it starts as like a shmup, a shoot 'em up, an old school shoot 'em up, yeah. like a, a, yeah, with um, uh, space vehicles, and yeah, you need to. Uh, it's like a, a, I don't know if you ever played Ikaruga games like that on the on the Dreamcast came to, uh, Dreamcast GameCube and stuff, and you have to switch your ship between the different coloured um, energy projectiles that are being fired at you. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. Um, I I never played it, but I've uh, I've seen other people play it. Well, well that's what happens in near anyway, and uh, yeah, it it is. It's really cool. And then, as you say, it switches to the hack and slash, and then what else does it do? Um, there there are was... like loads of different you know segments. Yeah, fishing simulator at one point. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who I'd recommend the game to because it's one of those games that I recommend everybody should play it. But at the same time, I know that most people would hate it. Um, it's, it's a tricky one. It's definitely a niche title that requires a lot of um, patience and attention. And there's just so... It, the, the entire game is subtext, essentially. You're just trying to um, decode riddles uh, from, mm. from beginning to end. And it's there's nothing spelled out for you. Uh, you, you really have to fight to understand what's going on um above the surface story i think and the, yeah and 
the story is the main driver. The gameplay itself is 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 fun, but never really deviates too much from uh, a a very Japanese style hack and slash game. Yeah. The heavy attack, the light attack, and then the the gun droid ranged attack, and and that's about it. Yeah, it's a game. I must admit, it's a game. I think I rushed through a little bit when I first played it, as much as I enjoyed it, because as I was saying, got massive backlog, and it, I was in one of those mind frames of, uh, you know, get this done, next thing, <laughs> um, and but in the same way, I don't know if we've had this conversation about uh, Akira, where the first time I watched Akira, I thought that was really good, uh, but there would there was just something where I was like, yeah, I want to watch that again. Need to watch that again, and Nier's very much the same, in that uh, I need to replay it and just, uh, you know, understand it, playing it through again. If that makes sense, mm. um, yeah. Because there are so many aspects, and there are uh, multiple endings. I think, aren't they? There, there are so many ways that you can play the game. Um, yeah, I think there's thirteen or something. Mm, mm. Um. And it had the novel option as well as uh, the, uh, the the actual game designer and developer is uh, is all about sort of deconstructing what video games are. But you can buy all the trophies in game. Um, yeah, and to, yeah, and, and to get the last trophy, like if you're not just sort of like buying your way through it, um, is uh, it, it just asks you like, uh, do you want to delete your data so you you'll have nothing, uh, so you can restart it all again. Um, and that gives you a trophy, um, but you've got to make sure, damn sure, that it's the last one, because otherwise you've got to start literally everything from scratch again. Yeah, you do. That was one thing I was very aware of. <laughs> <laughs> you you need to follow the exact rules of, of that trophy. One false step and, and you're done for, as you say. I just put the intro on the screen uh, for the Twitchers and the YouTubers. Uh, so this is how the game uh, starts it does start with the uh the space battle um uh yeah um are you got any plans anytime soon to go back to it do you think did you I, it? did you get the oh no no i finished the game but um i i just couldn't there were so many things that i i just couldn't face and at that point it would have been so much for grind to achieve it mm. i just wanted to um, much as I'd enjoyed it, I didn't want to run it into the ground yeah. and just make it a chore. But the, uh, they, they, that is the game, but beautiful. They do have a true ending, which, as I say, you've mm. got to jump through all these hoops, and um, it is it is worthwhile. Uh, I, I will say that to to get the true ending. Um, it's it's, uh, it's it, the, sorry, go on. The, the the two branches is there one beyond that? Uh, what do you mean? Players B two and A three. Oh, it goes far beyond that. Oh damn! I do need to keep playing it then. Yeah. So what happens is, uh, you okay? So, uh, you know, this is where it gets so complicated. And minor spoilers for anyone who might want to play it. So you you play the game once as two B, mm -hmm. which yep. is the main female character, and then do you play the game again as her? I can't remember. Uh, no, then you play as the then you the play boy. As, as the as the boy. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to get this in my head. There's right, so you play as as uh two B, who's the girl, and you literally finish the game, and it gives you all the endings and things, and you think, oh, well, that's the end of the game, and then it starts back up again, and you play the entire game through, but from the perspective of her sidekick companion, which is. A young boy which is really interesting and then that finishes and then it goes back to 2b again and you play the game through again as her i think um and then you go you you complete that game and then you go and play as uh a a, like a name a what's the name sorry i thought it was a three no that's not right i don't think but then you go and play as this completely different character and then you go back. It just okay. goes. It just goes all over the place, and that's kind of the magic of the game is, um, just the perspectives that it shifts through, and you never know when you're finished. <laughs> um, well, I thought I had finished it. Yeah, I. Hang on. Let me 
Let me see if I can find it. But then you get all the different stories as well, like the uh, the droids that have that have gone um, rogue and set up their own little society. They're sort of just there on the initial playthrough. Then you get a tiny bit more and a tiny bit more. And then by the time you get to, I'll call it A3 for, for the sake of it. By the time you get to A3 storyline, you're like setting up the droid revolution and all of that's going on. And it's just so, it's so slow and methodical for the first couple of playthroughs. And then suddenly, bam, here we go. Here's the payoff. And mm. that just goes mental. It's amazing. Yeah, that's actually a great point. Uh, which I completely forgot, uh, but that's what I mean about um, sticking through it and paying attention. Because yeah, it's, it's another one of those games where you have to invest a lot of time before the the the, the payoff to to all these little uh, bits of the story come together. Um, right at the end, right? Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, comp so to get the platinum, complete the introduction and route A. So that's one playthrough, uh, sort mm -hmm. of, and then you complete. Route B, which is a second playthrough, <laughs> and then you complete Route C, D, and E. <laughs> so there are essentially <laughs> five separate aspects to the game. There are five. Um, how would you call them? Uh, uh, branching story paths. No, it's not that. Well, so you. I'm pretty sure you played the game three times, which is just the same game but from different perspectives. And then yeah. there are two epilogues, almost, on top of that. Um, okay, so... It's the point that I got to then, because I've got all the main story achievements, like, scrolling down. Uh, oh, well, you may have done it then. Um, da -da 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 -da. God, this is bringing back memories. The One of the hardest trophies to get is called View the Final Credits. I don't know if you have that one. The mind, The Minds That Emerged. No, no, not a chance. <laughs> Do you have achieved? Oh, it's A two. Achieve A 2s ending. Uh, yes, I've I've got A two and uh, what's the name of the lad? Nine uh, S. Nine S. I've got uh, both their endings because he he goes on an interesting path, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, in so, fact, you could talk so much about that. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay, well. Yeah, I think you may be just missing like Scott. a final branch of the story then. Or maybe you just didn't even do them in the correct order uh, or, or something. Uh, but, 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 but yeah, there are like five separate segments to the story anyway. Long, long-winded way of saying it. <laughs> uh, yeah, the minds that emerged... Yeah, uh, just looking through all the uh, connected... Oh, right, no, I haven't got that because it would delete my save data. So... It would delete your save data? Yeah, so I'm at the point now where I could potentially do that, but I've got various trophies to mop up. Oh, I see, right, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of um, holding your breath, I think, when you go through the game because it, it's, uh, it does play with the... Um, very idea of being a video game, I think, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. But for anyone that wants to just play something a little bit different, um, I don't know. I mean, it's clunky and it's awkward and it's obtuse, but there's nothing else quite like it. And it's probably been about four years since I played it. Mm. And I think of it very regularly um i i dwell on it as one of the best games of, of this console generation by far um and it's you, just so memorable and you can get it dirt cheap now you can get the game of the year edition very cheap mm. um i find it funny how the game of the year edition the only uh extras they included were like different costumes <laughs> yeah <laughs> which, is... which aren't worth it anyway <laughs> <laughs> it's a very fan service heavy fan service heavy mm. game um, because I went to the uh, 2018 Comic Con, and there was so much uh, near Automata sort of merchandise, but really weird merchandise, like um, images of of 2B and AS and uh, an A2 printed on glass on a stand. I don't were, remember that. Those. No, I don't remember that. I remember the statues and things that they were all incredible. Mm. Uh, I don't remember the glass, and the there are a lot of 
Um, cosplay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so much cosplay. Oh, and I bought that amazing art print from him uh, as well, didn't I? I've got that under the bed that it needs digging out. Mm, God, just the wonders that you have under that bed, I'm sure it's... Uh, yeah, could... Yeah, the, the original Evangelion, end of Evangelion posters. Oh, yeah. Oh, and that air one. I've got that uh, air poster. You'll have to do a room tour for us one of these days, Matt. And... Yeah, one of these days it's going to be pretty difficult. <laughs> There's not a lot of space to work with in here. Oh, that just makes it all the more exciting to go through, I'm sure. <laughs> I, uh, I remember the other day as well you got me um and your sister those disney prints uh going back a good few years oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's not bad. uh it used to be up on the, the disney shelf but it needed to be moved so uh yeah that's safely stored under there as well i completely forgot about that i don't know what my sister did with hers probably like threw it away <laughs> <laughs> they were from the disney store uh yeah they were limited edition prints and things yeah they were Oh, yeah, I remember buying those. I was chuffed to bits when I found them. <laughs> um, that was a long time ago. A longish time ago. Uh, we are an hour and 15 minutes into the show. Um, we're going to keep this one a bit light and breezy, this episode. Um, do you want to... Uh, is there anything else you want to touch upon? Or shall we uh, call it quits? Give it a... Oh, well, I've got two letters lined up as well, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is um, 2020 marks two anniversaries. The first one being the um, the 20th anniversary of the X-Men films, which we'll talk about a different date. But more importantly, the 30th anniversary of Tremors, one of my favourite film series um, uh, and favourite B-movie monster flicks. There it is. Tell us more. Uh, so, um, for the uninformed, Tremors is about the small, out in the uh, middle of nowhere town of perfection, as um, two handymen called Val and Earl, played by Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, uh, are two pissed off handymen that are dreaming of better things and decide to uh, get out of Dodge. But on the very day they decide to do that, the valley comes under attack from these giant prehistoric worms that have awoken out of nowhere after uh, centuries uh, of hibernation and it's just this fantastically written character driven b movie romp of this cast of uh, characters banding together to try and survive uh, an onslaught from these hyper intelligent always learning prehistoric worm reptiles that are hell bent on uh, on eating them all <laughs> charming it's absolutely charming i first found it on um I think it was Meta Motors back in the day, the no. early days of like, I, um, God, what was it called? Uh, the old Skybox. And Meta Motors used to have like the old monster movies on just after the the car section and before the porn. <laughs> you get like, the Fly and the Nightmare on Elm Streets and Tremors, Ginger Snaps. So that's where I found it and uh, had it recorded to VHS. And it, it just developed from there. I got the official VHS and then I did the DVD. Then, um, Finally, this year, they released an absolute bells and whistles Blu-ray edition that's a treasure of the collection at the moment. And to celebrate 30 years, they not only brought out a commemorative box set, but they made a seventh and final film with Michael Gross, who's been the, the mainstay of the series from the very beginning, as Bert Gummer, who's this um, survivalist, um, sort of very staunch, uh, my gun is my life, my life is my gun sort of guy who... Uh, has just travelled the globe by this point, hunting down the graboids, which continually evolve and mutate. Um, so it's been uh, it's been a long lived series um, that just a anyone that likes good character pieces or B movie schlock or just really good special effects from the uh, the late eighties, early nineties, you really can't go wrong with this film. It is one of those rare examples of a perfect screenplay where the characters well written. And all the setups have a payoff, and all the payoffs have a setup, which is so damn rare in in most modern films. Um, yeah, I, I could gush for hours about Tremors. I even got uh, my girlfriend, while well, my ex was good enough to get me a book uh, called Seeking Perfection: The Making of Tremors, uh -huh. which uh, goes up to uh, 2015 with the announcement of the uh, the then fifth film, and. Um, yeah, it's a true labour of love, and and watching the documentaries on the Blu-ray and reading the uh, the interviews with them in the book, 
it's clear how much passion and and love and excitement the creators and the people involved with the films have had over the last three decades and um it really bleeds through uh, i can't recommend tremors and um uh, at least tremors 2 aftershock the uh, the sequel as being well worth anyone's time so yeah that's that's my gushing thing one good thing out of 2020 is we got a decent tremors release and uh and a chance to say happy 30th birthday oh i love the uh, the artwork for the uh box set that's fantastic mm. that's really good it even comes with the the one in red is like the what do you call it an x-ray vision of a graboid <laughs> <laughs> that is ace it's uh yeah it's, it's a film you've already spoken about and to my shame I, i've never watched i think we must have we, we must have planned it at university at some point and just never got around to it i must have watched it with jess instead yeah possibly uh it's a great well, box yeah, though. <laughs> sorry say it again we're gonna have to watch tremors now yeah sure yeah next time i see you which you know a couple of years decade maybe. 2024 <laughs> <laughs> um but that box set looks uh looks stellar um yeah great uh fantastic so matt's recommendation of the day of the month of the year of the year <laughs> <laughs> it tremors um i'll save it for when we see each other next but i'm looking forward to that now you sold that really well to me uh my recommendation i'm just going to do this briefly because i could go into a long spiel. Uh, in fact, I did have it all set up, but uh, but I won't. But if you fancy something a bit uh, a bit different, we don't usually talk about wrestling on this show, but it's a it's a passion of mine. There's Wrestle Kingdom 15 coming up in the next few days. It is um, it's two nights this year. The last year was the first time that they did two nights. Uh, they're repeating that this year. It is essentially Japanese wrestling's equi- equivalent of WrestleMania. So on Monday the 4th and Tuesday the 5th. And um, yeah, if you have any interest in seeing uh, just some fantastic storytelling by way of uh, physicality, then uh, New Japan Wrestle Kingdom is, uh, is, is, is the place to be. It's, uh, it's what you want to check out. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got, as I said, I've got, I had loads of things set up to maybe go into this, but uh, we'll maybe do it another time. But um, lots of stories to check out. There are plenty of videos on on YouTube if you uh, if you are interested and want to get to know the histories of uh, of the uh, wrestlers and and the stories behind their feuds. But um, a lot of really um, really really good stuff. Really recommend it. Uh, alongside, I would also recommend Super Eye Patches. High patch wolves um just about to plug that yeah <laughs> yeah his his introduction to uh why wrestling is just as good a storytelling uh platform as television and movies and all that type of thing um go watch that and uh and then maybe check out wrestle kingdom because uh it, it really will be worth your time i think Ooh. and um yeah maybe next week I'll uh, I'll dive into a few of the stories that are told and that are paid off, and I think that might be pretty cool. So, really enjoy that. Yeah. So that it was. was yeah, because okay. it, it, wrestling was one of those things where my brother was sort of into it, ish, and we had the uh, the PlayStation One game, uh, the WWE one, but it wasn't until you showed me that Super Eye Patch Wolf where it was like, oh, oh wow, yeah, this is, I get it now. Um, it's still not something I actively watch, but. A combination of your enthusiasm and that that video really do uh, explain everything <laughs> that I just never got. Yeah, there. I mean, the WWE is essentially um, how to how to put this politely. If um, real, yeah, the WWE is what uh, reality TV is to New Japan's Scorsese. Let's 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 put it that way. Um, the uh, WWE has fallen off a cliff so much in the last, uh, I don't even know. I mean, I, I had a major gap in watching wrestling. It's only in the last five years I've come back to it. But um, it, it's it's sort of trash, re- without wanting to sound too hoity-toity <laughs> of a snob for wrestling of all things. But um, yeah, the, the, there's not much um, intelligent. They don't treat the 
uh, the viewer with respect and intelligence. Let's put it that way. I think that that's probably the best way to put it is that the WWE treats its viewer um, as though they don't have an attention span and they just want to see uh, big, loud entrances and um, that's about it. You know, oh, I, I mean, I'm, mm. I'm impressed by, by big muscles and things like that. Um, New Japan Pro Wrestling is... It, it's so finely crafted. It really is. You have long uh, stories. Um, the the image I've got uh, up on screen at the minute. The first, so the first night, there's a match. The main event match is between uh, uh, a guy called Tetsuya Naito and Kota Ibushi, and uh, and they've had a history of the last few years that has has culminated in this moment. They nearly killed each other. I think it was last year or the year for that or something because they just enjoy beating each other up and doing these ridiculous they call spots so a flashy you know doing something flashy is called a, a, a spot and um they they just try to outperform each other by breaking each other's necks essentially <laughs> is the way to put it and so they've got this long history of trying to kill each other in the most spectacular way possible and it's all culminated in uh in in, in this one match um on the first night that people that people are terrified about they're, they're, as much as they're excited about it they're terrified because these two kids try to one up each other so much that you you looking at you know uh, a, a potentially really disastrous situation and that's what makes you can't take your eyes off the screen <laughs> so that's on the first night and then the winner of this match for the main event of night two then goes on to wrestle uh, a guy called Jay White and if you can find any uh, footage of Jay White doing interviews on, on YouTube, I'd highly recommend it because when you think of the perfect villain, Jay White <laughs> is the perfect villain. He's just a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he just knows how to rile people up. He, he, he's he got the look. He's got the swagger. He is just effortlessly, effortlessly um, schmarmy. And you just want to hate him. And he just, the way he invites it on himself is exquisite. And when you look at wrestling as a character piece and as telling this long story, the story of Jay White is, is really fascinating because he was this um, this scrawny kid that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that people felt was put into the main, he, he, was a, he was a face, he was a good guy. And people felt he was put into the main event too quick and, and, um, and he couldn't wrestle and hang with the top guys. And then, uh, he turned and he went to the dark side. He went heel, and uh, and all of a sudden, overnight, <laughs> he changed his look and he changed his gimmick. And just as he did that, it's like he changed his style of wrestling, and he suddenly became one of the best wrestlers in the world, literally over overnight, because he he changed how he performed and 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 how he presented himself. And uh, with with changing his look and his in his gimmick, he uh, developed this ego. And there's no one in wrestling with the ego like what like jay white <laughs> and um and yeah so you've got that uh the match on the first night which is filled with so much history and then the, the night on the second uh then the match on the second night which is essentially the biggest asshole dick but you know you just hate him so much in in the world of wrestling against one of these two uh guys that are more than likely going to have killed each other on the prior night and it's like almost like a vulture going to go and pick off these two uh, these two good guys. Um, so it's really interesting. It, it, you know, it should be a good, uh, a good. It's like Christmas for um, for wrestling fans these these two nights. So yeah, that's my little plug for New Japan. If you, uh, if anyone out there fancies getting into it, uh, and as I say, I might do a bit of a recap mm -hmm. next week because it's something that uh, that excites me, as you can probably tell. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd take absolute delight with uh, hearing you recount it. <laughs> mm, yeah, well. Uh, maybe drop a bit more in from time to time in uh, in future uh but it's just you know it's not looked upon as as being in the geek culture despite it being in that mold so uh tend to stay away from it but uh maybe i'll drop bits and pieces here and there in future um do you want to uh jump into the letters before we go or yeah why not there was there was a nice little way to round things off aren't they let's go for it then i'll uh i'll let you uh, uh, take off. Here we go, Mister Matt okay. with the letters. Uh, I it took a 
a bit of rounding down which ones to talk about, actually. I found several that complemented each other quite well. And um, I could have easily just filled this entire podcast with just filling it with, with all these different letters that would have sort of interconnected. Um, but no, I've, I've stuck to the routine. Uh, so I've, I've got two and two which will go with. <laughs> so first and foremost, we have Pokemon Mania. And how many of these have been about Pokemon so mm. far? In 10 weeks, we've probably done at least eight, I'm guessing. Mm. Uh, but anyway, so Pokemon Mania. I have been studying up on the Pokemon craze over in Japan. <laughs> they have sold over 10 million games, and the way it has affected their culture boggles the mind. They have all sorts of little figurines and other little trinkets based on the game. There's a Pokemon TV show and a radio show. The closest thing that we can compare to is the craze. Uh, the closest thing that we can compare to is the Tamagotchi craze, although the Pokemon craze is on a far broader scale. I think that Nintendo should release Pokemon in the US. <laughs> RPG fans will gobble up the game. And the fact is, these little creatures are adorable. Here's hoping the revolution can cross the Pacific and reach American soil. May 1998, Mike Williams via the internet. He was on wow. something that Mike Williams, I think. He really was. If he didn't invest in that, then uh, the boy is probably, well, the man is kicking himself to this day. Well, as but, you, um, back in whenever it was, 97, 98, I forget which year it was, um, and the anime had just come on Sky 1. I don't know if you remember that. Mm. I don't remember it being that early, but I remember people telling me it was that early. Yeah, it was, it was. Um, I was... I watched it from literally like I think the second episode or something like that. It was crazy <laughs> early, and uh, I pretty much said the exact same thing to my mom. I was like, "This is so amazing! This is going to be huge! We need to start importing <laughs> things and and selling toys." This is me at eleven, twelve years old, uh, at, at saying exactly what this kid's saying, uh, and <laughs> then I went on to the internet and downloaded uh, like the fir the very first emulator uh, I ever downloaded and and uh, and a ROM of Pokemon Red. And this was like a year before it was released in the in the Western stuff. So that's actually really cool uh, because I was the same. And I remember going on the back when, excuse me, <clears throat> back when uh, websites were still rudimentary and they didn't even really have a, uh, they didn't do delivery. I remember going on the Toys R Us website and, uh, and taking stock of all the Pokemon <laughs> items that were on sale. And being like, we need to import all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, where do we, we don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, to have got that jump on the on the high street, that would have been amazing. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so what's your? Uh, when do you first remember Pokemon? Then. Um, it must have been round about 2000, I think. Uh, probably. It, it was through the TV show, I think, originally, because. I can't, how did we even get onto Pokemon? Because we, we is... tried Dragon Ball when Cartoon Network was advertising Dragon Ball Z as like the big thing. And uh, after months, what felt like months of waiting uh, with nothing but that dragon image to go on, me and my brother sat down to watch Dragon Ball Z and it was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> it's that <laughs> Japanese thing and turned it off. And so we probably would have avoided Pokemon for the longest time because it was the same thing. Um but somehow we eventually ended up on Pokemon. Uh, my brother was collecting the uh, the cards and he had the Game Boy game. Um, it, it was just sort of there. I can't remember when we started watching it, but it became the morning ritual, much to mum's chagrin. Um, that, would, that would explain why uh, Gold Silver hmm. was your first generation of Pokemon then, really, wouldn't it, if you came that late? Yeah, my brother got... Um, he got Fire Red and then Pikachu Electric um yeah. and yellow sorry um my <laughs> <I'm> mistake um <laughs> so i'm thinking of uh when they re-released green and uh and red about a decade ago yeah. um yeah so i i got gold just to sort of wade into it but i was happy watching it from the peripherals i enjoyed watching the show i remember the absolute madness when the fossil and jungle card sets were released in uh God, when would that have been? 2001, 2002? I can't remember. That was I never really took much of an interest in the cards. So uh, mm. I, I did initially, um, but it was the price that kept me away because yeah. they were an absolute fortune. So it wasn't even re really worth getting invested in too much. Mm. But, um, I mean, one of my, um, my friends is, is 
an absolute Pokemon fanatic uh, as of the first gen. He he doesn't regard anything apart from the the official Pokemon that were kicked into Generation Two because they wanted a sort of to keep the the amount on the cartridge more manageable. Mm. So he recognizes essentially 200 Pokemon, but nothing after that. Um, but he used to play the card tournaments and, and did that on a national scale and um, still kept up to it till fairly recently. And he still plays Pokemon Red and the emulators to this day. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. o- Only ever the originals. I think he won't go further than Gold and Silver. Um, well, I, 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 heart I, gold. Yeah, I can respect that. I mean, I've played a couple of games <clears throat> since, the, uh, since Generation 1, but very few... I, I couldn't actually tell you like a Pokemon from <laughs> any generation past past the first one, to be honest. Even though I've played uh, Diamond, Sapphire, <clears throat> uh, Y, you know, so I played all these games, but mm. none of them still seem to stick the way that the original uh, one one five one do. Mm. It must just be a generational thing more than anything. Mm. A oversaturation, and it was something unique and special. Um, mm. To the point that the Gen 1 stuff is, apart from Eevee, who across all the generations is still selling in all of her evolutions, um, it's as original 150, 151. Um, I got a jigsaw puzzle over um, the autumn, actually, that's the 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 first gen, and it was just an absolute delight putting that together. <laughs> oh, that sounds nice. Something, uh, oh yeah, that sounds great. Something I'd, mm. I'd definitely be interested in. Uh, do you want to read the response to the letter? Yeah. Sorry, we got uh, swept in nostalgia there. So uh, the response was, the revolution will be soiling, uh, saturating America very soon. This fall of 1998, Pokemon, pronounced Po-K-Man, <laughs> for Game Boy and Pokemon TV series, will be reaching North America. We're previewing Pokemon on page 51, and this summer we'll be featuring a regular coverage of the game along with Pokemon comic strip. That's a very nice and straight to the point. Uh, a response. I think that's the first one of those we've ever received that isn't trying to be some sort of uh, <laughs> comedy, you know, genius. Yeah, some armies setting them down. Yeah. Maybe because they know this kid's on the ball, it's like, ooh, maybe he can, you know, help direct the future. <laughs> Apart from the way that they pronounce Pokemon. <laughs> well, of course, this is Nintendo Power after Poke-Man. all. Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon. Although there's some people that call it uh, po- Pokemon, don't they? I'd never understood that Pokemon. But I don't know. How do you pronounce it? Po- Pokemon. Pokemon. Yeah. Po- Pokemon. Yeah, the the accent above the E is Poke Pokemon. I don't know. Who cares? Yeah. Second letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Will you still want us? And I picked this one, um, knowing how much of a Beatles fan you are. I was listening to the radio the other day, and I heard a song that had the refrain, When I'm 64. (laughs) I was thinking that it might be a good song for the generation of Nintendo systems. You know, as an anthology. Completely not registering the Beatles anthology there. (laughs) Except for the part when they sing, When I'll Be Old and Grey, Baron... I don't know if I can pronounce this and not get kicked off YouTube. Let's say Nike. Nig Baron Nig two thousand. Uh, P.S. The singers are called the Beatles. That's totally trolling, isn't it? That's that must be trolling. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. He's a kid writing into Nintendo Power in the early two thousands. It's possible. It's possible. He doesn't know who the Beatles are. Although that's a that's a great idea. When I'm sixty four, yeah, Nintendo. Well, Nintendo never do something like that. But that that would have been an interesting little twist. Um, mm. Yeah, partnering with the Beatles when I'm 64. <laughs> and the problem is, I think, much as they want to appeal to the older fans, you know, the the repeat buyers and, and the new fans alike, the Beatles are very old-fashioned, so mm. I can't imagine Nintendo wanting to be sort of saddled. They want to be young and hip while still releasing the same game, essentially, every two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let's, I, we need to do that Nintendo episode where I just let loose of my disgust of, <laughs> of what they've become. Uh, we, we the melancholy of uh, of Daniel Suzumiya. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the response? I'm, I'm intrigued. So, uh, slightly more Sasaki this time around. The Beatles, never heard of them. No, just kidding. We think that's a fine idea, but we don't have the $8 billion required to buy the song rights in our budget. And there's no shame in being old and grey. After all, we love our old black and white Game Boys to death. That little fella's been by our side through the years. That's another very good response. Very diplomatic. I like that. That's uh, that's very clever. 
Uh, Good way to uh, to start the year, that one. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, the both of those are excellent picks there this week. Mm. Yeah, I really enjoyed those. Um, yeah, and um, that is the end of our very first show of 2021. That went really well. I really enjoyed Ooh. it. Thank you for being with me, Matt. I hope that uh, everyone out there enjoyed our more freestyle ramblings this week. Uh, we we didn't want to follow too much free structure and uh yeah i think it worked out quite well so let us know if you'd like us to follow this this guideline a little bit more or stick to the old way of doing things uh most of the replies be i want more desperate scrambling as you try and find out disney songs and uh and actress <laughs> names <laughs> <laughs> or just maybe even make them up like uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah um, thank you for being with us and uh, looking forward to doing many more of these over 2021. We're in double digits now, Matt. That's episode 10. Fantastic. Wow. We made it, Dan. We did. The uh, big leagues. <laughs> <laughs> Only 10 more of these and we'll be on triple digits. Well, 10 times more of these. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 10 times. My math isn't that bad. I caught myself there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we already have plenty of examples of your maths being pretty terrible, so we'll... Uh, <laughs> it's pronounced anything. impossible. <laughs> but yeah, that's episode 10. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and yep, yeah, next week's show will be back to its regular uh, Thursday at 9pm slot. We hope, fingers crossed, touch wood. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, join us there if you can. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Matt. We'll speak to you later. Happy New Year, everyone. 2021, here we come.